It's great to see you this morning. Uh, and uh, if you're still coming in, please do come in and grab yourselves a seat. Uh, come and join us uh, to come and uh, encounter God this morning. It's great to see you all. I want to tell you about yesterday. Yesterday was a really special day and a day that I'm, I'm really sort of proud of the team for, for pulling off. Yesterday we did a festive feast, a uh, 100 Christmas uh, dinners uh, for a whole load of uh, community uh, events that, uh, that uh, a whole load of, com sorry, I'm just very aware of something cr crunching in this corner. I think it's just waking itself up. We've had a, a couple of technical glitches this morning. So we did 100 Christmas meals yesterday uh, for people who come and book the building or we know from St. Peter's community or beyond who are really uh, important and special uh, to us. Um, people who are maybe a bit on the fringe of the church, some of them, um, but we really wanted to go deeper in relationship with them and just chat with them and, and welcome them into the building and give them a, a meal and a, a Christmassy time. And it was a really special time. So we had the meal and then afterwards uh, we had our Chris Dingle service. I'm sure you'll have, if you weren't here, you'll have seen some of the pictures on social media. It, it was a really special service. Uh, and it was a huge team effort, all sorts of uh, different... Um You're right there, Matt. Oh, <laughs> no, don't right. worry about anything. <laughs> um, it was a really special service and a really, really good time. Uh, and the team worked so unbelievably hard to make it happen. So a special day in the life of St. Peter's. And I know from a number of stories that I've heard that a whole bunch of people were really impacted it by it. So a big thank you to Rebecca and everybody who, who did the work. Uh, the kitchen team were phenomenal uh, and a, a really good day. This morning was our second service uh, in Advent. It's the second Sunday of Advent, and we've got Tim Prince with us, who will be continuing on our studies in the first chapter of Luke. Uh, so really great to have Tim with us. He's here. There we go. He's down here. Uh, and uh, looking forward to what he brings to us a little bit later on. Can you see me over there, guys? It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> great. Let's pray. Let's settle our hearts. Uh, let's uh, come before him uh, and make sure we're ready to, to worship him wholeheartedly. Yeah. Father God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place and for the people you're, you've placed around us for us to connect with. We thank you for one another gathered in this place this morning as we come to worship. We thank you for family together. And Lord, will you bless us as we worship together this morning? May we encounter you. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, and may our hearts uh, be, uh, be warmed as we gather by the Holy Spirit. May we continue to dig deeper into you uh, in discipleship. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Mila and Ali and Pete, if you want to come, uh, to come and light two of our candles this morning. So do come up. So there you go, Mila. If you could just light a couple of the ones at the back. <coughs> Push it hard. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah, pop it down. Brilliant. Bless you guys. Vicky, lead us in worship. I, I have to second what Andy said yesterday. Was um, God was in s so in all the detail? It was just amazing. Um, so let's worship our awesome God, um, and please stand if you're able.
you are great <laughs> you deserve all the glory and all the praise Lord thank you that you show us glimpses of your kingdom Lord help us to look for those glimpses help us to see where the Holy Spirit is at work go before us Lord in Jesus name Amen Turn our eyes to you again. 
Receive our adoration. Isaac, I believe Isaac's coming up to share all the CYF news, so please do take your seats. <laughs> Hello. So, for this morning, you've got me on today's Children's and Young Families update as Rebecca is away on annual leave. So, first thing to mention is that yesterday's Chris Dingle went really, really well. Thank you for everyone who was involved, and thank you for everyone who came. It was really cool. It was a bit crazy at times, but I think that was all part of the fun, and um, yeah, it was just awesome. So, yeah, thank you guys for getting involved with that. So, in... Future news, I think that's the thing, I don't know. Um, we have the youth Christmas party on tonight. Yeah, woo! Um, it's just starting at 6 p.m. and finishing at 8 p.m. Um, so that's going to be lots of fun. There's going to be food there. So there'll be like pizza, there'll be hot chocolate, snacks. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, so make sure if you're a youth and you weren't planning on coming to that, you change your mind and come. Um, so that's the youth. And we also have... Um, next week on Sunday morning, an all-age cinema, which sounds amazing, and we're going to be watching a film called The Star, which I have never actually seen, but I've heard it's a very good Christmas film, and I'm very excited to watch it. Um, so that'll be for all ages um, from 2 to 15 next Sunday. It'll be uh, a cinema, so make sure you come along to that. For this morning, we have groups for children ages 2 to 15, um, and if you're not sure where you're going, I'll be out on the landing, um, sort of pointing people in the right direction to show you which group you will be going to. Um, and the last thing to say is just, um, as Rebecca is away, if you're a parent, I'm around, contact me. It would be really nice. She's worked really, really hard, so it would be really nice to just let her have a bit of time off, I think. So um, I'm always around. If you don't have my number, just come and find me, and I'll give you my WhatsApp or something like that. But... Um, I think we've got one more song before the kids go out, so back to Vicky. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the premise that you'll know some of the actions to this song, um, because I can't do them. And Ali, who usually does the, the actions to this song, isn't here this morning, because she worked so hard yesterday. <laughs> um, it's, she's tired out. Um, but yeah, please do, if you can, um, get to your feet, and uh, we're going to sing My Lighthouse. Shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh my. 
Great stuff. So uh, if you're going out to your groups this morning, please do. If you're unsure, if you're a visitor here or unsure where you're going, Isaac is now at the top of the stairs to have a word with him. Uh, let's pray for our children and young people as they go out. Your Father God, we just, uh, we're just so grateful for the way that you are adding to our CYF ministry uh, in number and, uh, and the way that they're thriving. Lord, will you bless them this morning as they gather in their groups. May they have a great time of, of learning about you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Christmas is upon us, and uh, we have already had three, or technically four, Christmas events uh, with a craft uh, event in the coffee shop uh, and wreath making in the coffee shop uh, and the festive feast which we did yesterday and the Chris Dingle service uh, last night. So we're well into things, but we've got further events to come. And the next one that I really want to highlight is uh, next Sunday evening, our carol service, which will be in a kind of soul food style in terms of room layout and some of the uh, component parts of the service. But it will have traditional carols, it will have some modern songs, it will have readings, uh, it will have various elements to it. And it's going to be a special time. Uh, lots of work going in to prep that uh, and really encourage you to come and to bring your friends. So please uh, do that. Please make sure that you, uh, you're here and uh, that you've invited people to come and join in the celebration of Christmas. So that's the 17th, next Sunday. Uh, and then on the 19th is our reflective service at 7.30 in the evening. Vicky is going to be leading uh, alongside Anne a time of, of quiet reflection, uh, just a little bit of calm in the busyness of Christmas. Or for those who maybe find Christmas a little bit tricky, we can calm and gather. But it's open for everybody. Let's take that opportunity to uh, not just celebrate loudly, um, but to draw close quietly to God this Christmas. Uh, and then on Christmas morning, we have our normal celebration service on uh, so, uh, two weeks tomorrow, uh, and we'll be gathering at 10 o'clock uh, for a family celebration. Uh, we have Christmas cards. I know a number of people have started to take packs out, uh, and we're, we're wanting people to do that and make sure that we fly the whole of St. Peter's Estate with our Christmas cards. Vicky is looking after all of that, and she's got boxes of them. But if you can help in any way, speak to Vicky afterwards. Don't just go and grab a pack of cards, but speak to her, and uh, that would be great if we can get those out over the next few days, make sure people are coming to our events. Uh, so... Uh, so lots and lots going on. We're also going to have an offering, a Christmas offering, uh, for two particular uh, charities. Uh, one uh, for Worcester Food Bank, um, which, is, which speaks for itself at this time of the year. There's such demand. Uh, we really want to help and assist them. Uh, so we're going to do that financially. Uh, and then we also very much recognize the crisis and the conflict out in the Middle East uh, with Israel and Gaza. And Tia Fund are helpfully 
uh, supporting that, and we would like to give half of our offering that way. So just uh, allow you to, to see that in advance. Um, there's the QR code. You can scan that off your phones in the room. Uh, and then there are also all the giving. That takes you to the website, which gives you the details of the bank account, but also a little portal in which you can give if you want to. Uh, and will there also be opportunities in our Christmas services to give into, uh, into buckets at the back uh, as a retiring offering on those events. But uh, let's give generously to those who have less than we do or have difficult situations uh, going on in their lives this Christmas. All of our events this Christmas are themed around hope. And we're going to pick up on the theme of hope in the new year. Uh, Vicky is putting together the Hope Explored uh, course, and we're going to run that um, in two, two different sessions. One, which is particularly aimed at those who come to Bumps and Babies at Eden Story, and run that in between those sessions on a Tuesday. And then there's also going to be a Thursday evening, Friday evening. Okay, we're back to Friday. Okay, uh, so it's a Friday evening in the new year, uh, and those dates will be coming out. Would, do you know the, the time when we start that on the Friday? Which date? Oh, yeah, um, 12th of January. So those who come are going to get this flyer, uh, and we're going to invite them to this course, Hope Explored. So do be praying that there's a real missional impact to our Christmas activities, and that people will come to that course, and that Vicky can show them a little bit more uh, about what hope really is, and the hope that we have as Christians. Can I also just remind you uh, to save the date for our church weekend away, which we're going to tell you loads more about in the new year, but just make sure this is in your diaries, and that is the 13th to the 15th of September next year, which may feel a long way away, but I know our diaries get uh, quickly filled, um, just to hold those dates, because we really want to go away to Lynchwood uh, Christian Centre uh, and have a special weekend away there to, together. And there's all sorts of opportunities for accommodation, or coming just for a day, or uh, uh, really uh, sort of top-end accommodation or camping, which is lower end, uh, and having a really good time together as a church family. Um, so um, it would be great to gather uh, in September uh, and uh, have a, a great time together as a church family. also want to tell you about the bereavement course, a bereavement journey that is coming up in the new year. And I want to show you this video, and then David and Shafali are going to come and tell us a little bit more about it. I lost my son, Addy, um, 25 years ago now. He was only three, three and a half. He, he died of viral myocarditis. My brother and my father died in Hong Kong during the pandemic. I have had multiple bereavements. I lost my mom to alcoholism, my dad later on, my sister to suicide, and my husband suddenly. I've lost a number of colleagues uh, to sudden death. I have had a miscarriage at around 10 weeks, and I've also experienced losing my baby at 28 weeks, and she was still born. My husband died of cancer. It was a long, horrible illness. My grandfather in 2000, and my father in 2008, grandmother in 2020, and my aunts in December 2020. Welcome to the bereavement journey. I'm Reverend Cassius Francis. I've been involved in helping churches to run the bereavement journey for a while now. And I'm here with my colleagues, Jane Unjan and Yvonne Richmond Tullock. Our aim over these weeks is to provide a safe place where our guests can take time out to understand where they are and to explore their loss. Loss is a natural part of life, which it's necessary for us to work through for our well-being. And our hope is that over the coming weeks, our guests will dare to face one of the hardest things that anyone can go through, the death of someone important to them, and work through what that means for them, and find ways to cope for a good and healthy future. Anyone who feels they haven't had the opportunity to grieve someone special in their life 
It's never too late to do good grief work, even many years after someone has died. David and uh, Shafali have uh, run this before uh, and to really helpful effect. Uh, and if you just tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing in the new year with a course uh, and who, who you would like to see come. Okay. Um, oh, can I just add, it's so lovely coming into the church, see that, that flower arrangement on the stairs mm -hmm. saying hope. Saying hope, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Sue and the team have done a beautiful job on them again, haven't they? And Life can seem very hopeless it, when you've suffered a major loss, a bereavement or whatever in your life. And Paul says, doesn't he, um, if we have hope for this life only, we are of all men most miserable. But our, there is hope in this life and that's part of why we're doing this bereavement journey course. It's a new upgraded one <laughs> from the one we did before. It's uh, seven weeks now. And it's for people of any faith or no faith. There is an optional uh, one at the end to, for Christians. Fantastic. So, uh, uh, Shafali, would you just tell us a little bit about, maybe about the, the course that we've, we've done in the past and the effect that it's had? And then I know you have something to share with us. Yeah, we've um, had people on the course that haven't just um, had a significant death, We've also had people that are, I mean, death is about loss and life at times is about loss. All of us have suffered, suffered loss at some stage, but some people are living with a living loss, which is like somebody who's caring for somebody who's got dementia. Um, so we've had some people that have come on the course that uh, have anticipatory grief and they have found that the um, course and the actual videos have been really helpful for them to be able to talk in a safe space with others that are talking about their grief and that they, it's prepared them for what may come in the future. We're not very good, I think, or haven't been very good at talking about death and all that events, and I hope that these videos will help us to get better at that. So, so we're running the course in the new year on Thursday afternoons, 2.30 till yes. 4, uh, from the... 1.30. One, sorry? 1.30. So 1.30, sorry. Uh, and yeah. January the 11th, <laughs> this is the start date, so second week of January. Mm. Uh, and if you are interested in that, please do speak to David and Shafali. Got some booking forms. With some booking forms here as well. So uh, do speak to them afterwards. And there's some flyers as well. If you think of somebody who you would like to tell about the course, uh, there are some flyers for the course just outside the doors is on the way out of the room. Shafali, you had something you wanted to share as well. Okay, well, you've said some of the things. I just want to share this um, poem by Robert Frost. And it really spoke to me when I was dealing with my own um, bereavement. The rain to the wind said, you push and I'll pelt. They so smote the garden bed that the flowers actually knelt and lay lodged, though not dead. I know how the flowers felt. So if you've ever said a deeply significant goodbye, you know yourselves how the flowers felt. You know, when you see your garden and they're great one moment and then a storm comes lashing them and they bend and they look as though they'll never lift their heads again. That's where our hope comes in with the videos. At these times, we can be bent over and we can be crushed like the flowers that lay lodged, though they're not dead. The pain can be overwhelming and often too deep for tears. Saying goodbye is a part of all of our lives, no matter what country we come from, whatever culture that we come from, we all have to face death. And we do it in different ways. 
So these videos, as you've seen, give people a chance to hear and connect with what's happening emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And the discussion groups make it possible for a safe space for them to process some of the questions, the thoughts, the emotions, or just to listen. So we're all on a same or similar journey. No two people grieve the same. So if you do know anybody, or if anybody that's watching online, if you know anybody that might you think might benefit from these videos, you do not have to be a Christian. The first six sessions do not mention anything about faith. That's why there is an additional session, which is session seven, and it's optional. And that's where faith questions are discussed. So please invite somebody. It doesn't have to be a recent bereavement. A loss oftentimes triggers other past bereavements or loss that have never been processed. And if they haven't been processed, they will still remain within you, within our emotions. They do need to be grieved. And we are there to try and help people grieve well. Thank you both so much, uh, and for being willing to, to lead the course again. So uh, uh, it's a really helpful uh, part of our, our sort of pastoral provision here. So thank you both. I'm going to ask Anne to come and lead us in prayers. Not me, folks. Sorry, it's not Anne. Uh, no one can find Anne, so we're going to pray that she's okay. And I'm just going to pray, unprepared, but pray my very best prayer for you guys. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this church, for this community, for every person that we touch. Lord, help us walk and talk more like you. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your grace. Touch us now, today, Lord, in a new encounter, a fresh encounter with you today, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we place today in your hands whatever that looks like because we trust you. We place some of our heavy burdens at the foot of the cross. And we say, have your way, Lord. Have your way. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for today and the week ahead of us and the month ahead of us. And Lord, we pray that we can hang on to hope like we've never done before. In your mighty, mighty name. Amen and amen. I just, um, I also want to pray. I want to pray um, for Anne. Um, I just pray, Lord, that um, that you are keeping her safe and um, that whatever is going on will be something um, that isn't insurmountable. <laughs> um, yeah, and Lord, I just pray for those who are really struggling with sickness and um, chronic illness and... Um, mental illness Lord and I just pray that you would draw near to each one that you would pour out your healing oil on each one and that they would know that you are right in it with them in Jesus name Amen
Hope has a name, <laughs> and that name is Jesus. And Lord, uh, as Tim comes up to share your word with us now, anoint his words, Lord, and give us open ears and open hearts to receive what you have for us today. That we would leave this place changed more into your likeness. Be with him now and bless him, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you again this morning. Uh, before I start, can we just also pause for another word of prayer? Because sometimes I think uh, services can sort of come together. They're sort of a bit here and a bit there. And sometimes we just need to pause and just allow the Spirit to say, now, what are you saying through all of this? Uh, where are you leading us this morning? And okay, it'll be different places for different people. 
but let's just allow the Spirit to not just say, here are various bits that we're offering you and of which this message is just another bit, but what is it that the Holy Spirit is saying to us as a group? How is he weaving these things together? Because he always does. So, Father, we just want to continue to offer our time together to you. We ask, Lord, that uh, we don't just come here to, uh, to, to offer something to you, but that we also might receive from you this morning. Receive a living word, as, as Vicky's just prayed, that we might be changed, that we might be moved from the place that we were when we arrived to a new place. <coughs> Father, that's what you're doing in our lives, uh, the whole of our lives. But we want each step to be intentional. And Lord, we want to be sensitive. We want to tune our hearts and minds into the voice of your Holy Spirit this morning. As we uh, are aware, Lord, that you are speaking through all sorts of different aspects of our time together. Lord, help us, we pray, to build that picture, Lord. To have a sense, Lord, that we have been in your presence and that we've not just offered to you, but that you have given to us. And so we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now I usually introduce myself when I'm here as El Breed's dad and everybody knows that, oh that's who it is, okay. Uh, last time I spoke um, was in August um, and Eleanor had just been married to Matt for about three months, four months, something like that. So for me to call somebody El Breed who'd been Eleanor Prince to me for the whole of her life was kind of weird. Um, it's still a bit weird to be honest. But, but we're getting there, aren't we? So it's great. So anyway, that's me. I want to recap uh, from last week because uh, the, the passage that we're going to read very much flows on from last week. And the message that I want to bring to you really also flows on from what Andy brought last week. Uh, this is the second in, the, in our Advent series uh, for this year. Uh, which is we've been titled Eternal Hope and with a sort of subtitle of Generation to Generation. And when Andy spoke last time, he spoke of a, of a kind of a period of longing. He was talking about Zechariah, of course. Um, and Zechariah and Elizabeth were longing for a child. They were in their old age. They didn't have a child. And there was a sort of shame about that which maybe coloured their their lives, I don't know, but they, they had a longing for a child. And the nation as a whole had a longing for the Messiah, this, this person uh, promised by God who would lead Israel as a nation into, into freedom, into greater freedom. So it was a real time of, of longing for, for all sorts of things at all sorts of different levels. And Andy finished, and I'm going straight down here into... Uh, to, to hit you between the eyes with this. Andy finished with this question. Are you waiting well? Whatever it is that you're waiting for, perhaps it's waiting to light a word, perhaps it's a longing that you have. Are, are, are you holding that longing in your hearts? Are you holding that well? And he also said about uh, that waiting, waiting for something deepens our faith. Uh, so therefore we have to wait with courage and with hope. And I'm bringing that right down at the beginning of, of what I have to say, because as I said, uh, what I have to say really follows on from what Andy brought last week. So I, I want to bring us right into focus on where we were last week at the end, and let's continue along that path straight away. It's really important that we ask these questions because so much, I think you'll agree, in all sorts of different ways is changing right now. Society itself is changing. It's throwing off the vestiges, such as they were of Christianity, that, that held it together. It's, it's discarding them purposely. I don't know if you noticed, but on Google, when you just go onto Google to search for something, it doesn't say Christmas holidays anymore, it just says festive holidays. Mm. Just little th 
things like that where society is, is intentionally discarding everything that, that we hold dear. The church, the church in general, I mean, is going through some really difficult times, some difficult conversations, um, some potentially damaging conversations. Uh, it's struggling with its finances in general. I come from a background of rural ministry, tiny churches, uh, which, of which many are now closed, many more are closing, and unfortunately, many medium-sized churches are now beginning to feel the pinch as well for, for many different reasons. We're in a, a situation where the international outlook is difficult, isn't it? The war in Ukraine rumbles on. The war in Gaza takes up much of our, uh, our, our news at the moment. These, these are uncertainties which are echoed in other places, maybe less high profile, but they're echoed everywhere. And the very nature of, of our international scene is difficult. And all these uncertainties, they sort of spill out into our own personal lives, don't they? They can do. Uh, there's sort of a background of which we have to cope with our own difficulties, our own problems. We've just been thinking about how we deal with bereavement. There are other, hundreds of other things, of course, that can affect us. But all these things, uh, all these things give us a, a background and, a, and, a, and a, um, the way in which we live our lives is affected by all of these things. And so when I come to read... Uh, this passage that we've got today, I really feel that these verses help us in, in lots of different ways, but help us to live in a period of waiting, in a period of uncertainty, in a period where we need to stand firm as the people of God in lots of different situations. These verses help us to do that. They help us to begin to answer the question, if if that question's been raised in your hearts, are we waiting well? So our reading is uh, Luke chapter 1. We continue in, in uh, Luke chapter 1 for, for all four of these Advent messages. We're in Luke chapter 1. Uh, we're reading from verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no, God, sorry, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. 
Beautiful words, aren't they? Familiar words, perhaps, but, but beautiful nevertheless. Uh, and Luke, in this part of, his, uh, of this chapter, introduces us to just one new character, of course, the character of Mary. And we basically find out four things about Mary. Uh, first of all, we find out that she's from Nazareth. Um, now, I don't know if you're aware of the geography of, of, uh, of the Holy Land, but uh, Israel is kind of down in the south. Uh, and at that time, the majority of Israelites lived in that sort of southern area. But there was another Israelite area called Galilee, which was in the north. Uh, and that's where Mary was living, and quite possibly where she was from. Now, it's quite handy in many ways that we have, uh, uh, our, our country is sort of also, I say divided, but many people disagree with me, between the south and the north. Uh, and you kind of get that sort of sense that if you live in the south and the north is, I've got to be really careful what I say here, but <laughs> <laughs> the north is sort of like a, a foreign country <laughs> almost. I know it's not. But, but uh, imagine if... Uh, you got to heaven and you queued up to shake Mary by the hand. Uh, and she turned round and said, uh, why, yay, man? <laughs> now, okay, she's not going to speak to you in a, for, in a, in a Newcastle accent, but, but she may have a, a, an, a, the equivalent accent in, uh, in uh, Aramaic, I suppose they were speaking at the time, uh, which uh, m might surprise you if you understood what it was. We, don't tend to, we tend to see this lovely picture of her with her blue robes, don't we? We don't think about her as being a, well, a real person in some ways. But, but she was. That's who she was. So she's from Nazareth. That immediately speaks and says something. We also learn that she was a virgin, which of course is important to the message that uh, the angel brings, and that she's engaged to be married. So if you put those two things together, we can be pretty sure that she was a teenager. That was where the teenagers of a certain age at that time in, in, uh, in that history, uh, that's when they got married. That's when they were betrothed. So maybe she's 15, 16, something like that. Then we find out that she's going to be married to a guy called Joseph, who is a descendant of David. And if he's a descendant of David, that means he comes, he traces his line of genealogy back through the, the tribe of Judah. And that is also important because Judah was where the kings came from, the kings of Israel. They were all through the line of Judah. Uh, so if somebody uh, in the first century who was reading this would pick up all these things straight away. For us, we need to maybe just think about them and just uh, understand them a little bit more, but even in that short, uh, those short introduction to Mary, they, they get a really reasonably good picture of who she was straight away. And what I would like to do is contrast uh, a, a number of these points that, that come up in this passage with the previous passage that Andy dealt with last week. That's the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Zechariah in the temple receiving a, a, a visitation uh, uh, and, well, I don't need to go through it all because Andy did it last week. There are lots of contrasts, but there are some similarities as well. Uh, one of the similarities is, of course, is that they did both individuals did receive a, a visit from an angel. And it wasn't just uh, any old angel. We know it was the same angel, and we know that because we got the name of the angel, Gabriel. They both received a message from God. Quite an unusual message in both cases, but they both, those were, that's one of the similarities between the two. And uh, the messages were given both to devout people, both to people who feared God, who were uh, waiting for God in their own way. But I, I, want to, I want to pull out the contrasts, and I think that's 
really one of the points that Luke was making when he wrote these two passages. Of course, he didn't write them just thinking, I've got to write that passage, and then I've got to write that passage. It, it, it was one continuous flow and narrative. But um, don't ever think that when we read the Word of God, that we're reading something that was written 2,000 years ago, therefore it must be simple. Because it's, not, it's absolutely not the case. All of our, all the writers that we have in here were really sophisticated writers. Much more sophisticated than many, many writers are today. So don't ever forget that when you come to the Word, because there's so many layers in the Word of God that take time for us to understand. But the writing that, that we have in this passage and right the way through is at a level of sophistication that uh, maybe often we're not used to. Zechariah then, he was old. And in, that, in this context, that means he was highly respected. He was from the south. Uh, I cheated for that because you only find that out in verse 39. Um, he was from a town in the hill country of Judea. Okay, but we know then that he was from the south of the country. Uh, and we know, of course, that he was a priest. That means he was a religious person. He was right at the center of the, the life of the, the religious life of the nation. And the contrast with Mary is acute. She was young. She was from the north. She wasn't anybody particularly, certainly not in terms of uh, national importance. She was a person who, her job was to have children for her husband. Her job was to bring those children up. Her job was to create a home with all the, uh, everything that was involved in that for that family and for her husband. And that was I would say that was pretty much it, but in many ways, that was what, she w what was expected of her and nothing else. So, straight away, we've got a huge contrast in the two people that are addressed in these two passages. The next contrast that I want to point out to you is found in verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. A, a lovely greeting, but actually if you look back into uh, Zechariah's encounter, the angel doesn't greet Zechariah at all. I'm not saying that that's a negative thing, but what I'm saying is that heaven viewed Mary as this highly favoured lady, to quote some carol or something or other. Uh, and, and viewed Mary very differently in many ways than the way that people would have viewed these two characters. They would have uh, put Zechariah in an important place. They would have put Mary perhaps also in an important place, but a very much lower important place. And yet heaven reverses that. It doesn't matter whether you've got all the, the frock and the, uh, the dog collar and all that stuff. I know they didn't have dog collars in those days, but you'd under you understand what I'm saying. The religious, just because you've got the outward appearance of religiosity, doesn't mean anything at all. It's the heart that God looks at. In that passage from Samuel where Samuel's looking for... Uh, the, anoint, the one to anoint next king and rejects all the, the tough guys and picks little David out. It's the same here. Now there's a similarity that crops up next in that both of these individuals have a fear reaction, I suppose, to the fact that there's an angel standing in front of them. It's a supernatural thing. Um, there's a sense, isn't there, whenever we think about such things that maybe the hairs on the back of our necks kind of go up. And if, if that's the way that we think when we think about these things, imagine if something like that happened, actually happened, and there was an angel in front of us. I think one of the important things that we can learn from that is that this is a full-on angelic appearance. 
What, what I mean by that is it's not an angel disguised as a person. We get that in the word as well. But this was not one of those occasions. This is, uh, this is the real thing, if I can say that. You know some of the adaptations that you see on TV and you think, okay, these guys didn't have a terribly big budget because there's just like a, a, a light that shines off from the, screen, uh, from the left of the screen or something and the person that's receiving the message just sort of stands and looks. It wasn't like that, I don't think. It was a, this is an angelic person, this is a heavenly being right in front of me. And the, the reaction to that right the way through the Bible, actually, whenever that happens, is that people are, are really scared, often fall down, and angels have to say, don't be afraid. And that's exactly what happened in this case, in both cases. The angel says, don't, don't be afraid. Now, another uh, contrast is that the first thing that the angel says to Zechariah is, your prayer has been answered. We've already looked at the fact that they were longing for a child. And th that's presumably what the angel is, is referring to in this case. But to Mary, it, there's none of that. To Mary, he says, you found favor with God. Presumably, there was no urgent prayer from Mary's point of view. Presumably, there was no deep longing, at least not one, not one that we're aware of. She'd kind of got her whole life ahead of her. Her whole life was, was really getting going. She was going to be married. And everything that comes from that, family and things like that. So in many ways, she's at a totally different stage of life. So this is a real surprise to her that she's got this message. You found favor with God. Then the angel gives his message to both of them. And in both cases, he tells them that they're going to have a, a child, a, a son. To Zechariah and Elizabeth, of course, they're going to have John, the, John the Baptist. And he covered uh, a lot about John the Baptist last week, and I've no intention of going back over that. So I want to focus on what the angel said to Mary, which is to tell Mary about Jesus. And uh, the angel tells Mary basically four things about Jesus that, that we, can, we need to just take some note of. First of all, that Jesus is going to be the Son of the Most High. I mean, we, we're kind of so used to this language, aren't we, that we understand it straight away. But imagine you'd never heard anything like that before. What on earth would you make of that? What does that actually mean? And then slightly confusingly, the second thing is that he's going to have the, fr the throne of his father David. It makes me think, well, how can you be the Son of the Most High and yet have a father called David. The only thing that I can really come out of that is that it's, it's holding something in tension, isn't it? It's holding the fact that Jesus, when he came to earth, was, uh, was, was God, but also man. Was fully God, somehow, but also fully a human. And if you ask me to explain it beyond that, I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> but you understand what I mean, or at least hopefully you get a sense of what I mean. It's a mystery that we can't really fully explain, but which maybe it, particularly at this time of year is something that we can just take out again and say, thank you, Lord. I don't get what you, what, I don't understand it. But I give you thanks that you have uh, brought about this, this wonderful visitation, this beautiful incarnation in, 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 our, in, our, in my life, in all of our lives, in the life of our whole world. Then we get the fact that he's going to reign over Jacob's descendants. So who are Jacob's descendants? Presumably the people of Israel, the children of Israel, in fact, is where the Old Testament would de describe it, literally, in this case, Jacob's descendants, ja Jacob's children were Reuben, 
don't ask me to ask about all of it. <laughs> Joseph Benjamin, there you go, there's the thing. In the right order. <laughs> but they are the people of God. Um, and you, in some ways you can understand why the Israelites thought, right, this is our moment. But throughout the Bible, or certainly throughout the, Old Te- the New Testament rather, the, bo- the, the New Testament writers are asking the question, who, who are the people of God? Who are the ones that this, this Messiah is coming to reign over? And the answer, of course, very, very simplistically, is all those who believe in his name. Then we find out that uh, his kingdom will never end. And again, w- again, we're sort of so used to that phrase that we just make it part of what we believe. But imagine somebody had said that to you uh, without any of the knowledge that we have, a kingdom that will never end. That doesn't make any sense. Most Israelites would say, well, we've had the Romans now for a while, and the Romans have been around for some hundreds of years already, and I hope and pray that the Romans aren't a kingdom that will never end. A very different outlook on that sort of thing. So what is the nature of this kingdom that will never end? We can look at history and say there are many, many regimes kingdoms that rose, but thank goodness they ended. So for a kingdom that will never end, that kingdom must be very, very different. It must be very, very special. It must be something outside of, of certainly of Mary's experience of kingdoms so far. So although I'm not going back over what was said over uh, John, you can see that what was uh, spoken over the life of Jesus is very, very different. Although they're pointing in the same direction, of course. And it reminds me of that verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, which uh, just talks about fixing our eyes on Jesus. We can learn and understand about all these other people But, in in fact, John himself, one of the most amazing things about John's ministry was that he was constantly pointing away from himself, constantly pointing towards Jesus. I must decrease and he must increase. And we must keep, although the whole of life busies around around us, we must keep our eyes fixed on, on Jesus in order to in order to, uh, to come through this time of waiting. Just a couple more uh, contrasts that I want to bring out to you. Actually, the next thing's a similarity. They both ask a question, but the question is different. Zechariah asks a question, and this is where he puts his foot in it, isn't it? Zech- Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? Uh, And he also refers to the the physical difficulty as a fact that they're old, they're old people, so how can they have children? Um, I I love this response from Gabriel. (laughs) I just wonder, you know, when we read these things, we tend to read them quite flat at face value. But I just want you to use your imagination for a minute. What, What was Gabriel's reaction? Have you ever heard of an angel that was just really hacked off. (laughs) It's possible, isn't it? Maybe it was just disdainful of Zechariah's lack of faith. Uh, Gabriel, (laughs) I stand in the presence of God. Maybe he was really disgruntled. Maybe... uh, Maybe it was a bit of a VIP. You know, some of the when, when somebody says to you, don't you know who I am? <laughs> Usually I, s- I just say, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am Gabriel. 
I stand in the presence of God. Uh, maybe he was just downright angry. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Uh, maybe he was really getting into the, uh, into the sort of the northern thing and he was going, now then, now then. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was none of those things. <laughs> but I want you to... Uh, I want you to forget everything I just said. No, I want you to. <laughs> I want you to uh, realize, if you realize nothing else, that there's a lot of colour under all these words. Okay, so when you read every anything from the Bible, look for the colour in the words, look for the personality in the words, look for uh, because quite often God is speaking through those things equally as much as the words themselves. If you understand what I mean. Uh, see, Mary asks a question which, uh, if you're not careful, sounds very much the same as Zechariah's question. Um, Mary's question is, how will this be since I'm a virgin? <coughs> so she's also pointing to the physical difficulties that, in the same sort of way that Zechariah was. But I don't think anybody could be blamed for not understanding how that would work, could they, really, let's face it. And uh, sorry, Gabriel explains that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon her and the child will be conceived in that way. So we've looked at a, a range of contrasts and I think that these contrasts are built up by Luke to point to the final contrast which I want to bring to you now. And that's the reaction of both people which are very different. Zechariah, we don't even know what his reaction was, do we? Because all he could do was make signs. So we don't know where he was. We don't know how he, how he was reacting. But Mary's reaction is this. I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What a beautiful reaction. What a humble reaction. What a trusting reaction. Trusting in the goodness of God, as we sing often. I've just realised that my time is really gone. So I'm just going to finish off very quickly by bringing that back to say, are, are we waiting well? Are we waiting for whatever it is that we're waiting for? And that could vary between very personal things and very wide uh, understandings of Scripture. Are we waiting like Zechariah? Are we letting doubt trip us up or fear trip us up uh, and rob us of our peace as we wait? Or are we waiting like Mary with humble acceptance of the will of God in our lives? God never asks us to wait without hope, ever. Ever. But I think he's more pleased with us uh, in our waiting than he is when we receive the thing that we're waiting for, if we ever do. He's more pleased with us because he's more pleased with our faith in him. He's more pleased with our trust in his word than he is with if we can see something in, in front of our faces. Uh, just think of uh, Thomas. Uh, Jesus says, "More, uh, you know, you're blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen." So, as somebody said to me recently, learn how not to panic when we can't see, when we're in a place that we've come out from somewhere and we haven't yet arrived in the place that we're going to, and we're waiting. Learn not to panic. The difficulty for us is that we try and organise things. We want to know where everything's going. Let's learn, if we learn anything from this Advent season, this season of waiting, this season of trusting in God, let's learn to do that with full trust. 
with full obedience. And let's learn from the example of Mary that we have in here. May God bless his word. Andy. Thanks, Tim. Just to reassure everybody, um, contact has been made with Anne and she's fine. So, <laughs> I know. Uh, it's hard, isn't it, when you, 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 know, you expect somebody to be there and then they're not. You always worry. Um, but we need to not panic, as Tim said. Um, so, uh, yeah. Let's uh, remind ourselves of our living hope. Um, please stand if you're able. i
Oh, we praise you, Lord. We thank you that we have such hope in you. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. Help us to wait well. Help us to see who you are. Help us to respond uh, as you would have us do. Amen. Thank you, Tim, so much for encouraging us and helping us with our message this morning. Really grateful. Um, I'm really looking forward to next Sunday and Vicky continuing on the series uh, and uh, looking at Mary's song. You can practice your northern accent uh, for that. Uh, can do Mary's song. Do you, can, you can sing can it in a Geordie northern accent. accent. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. You've got a week. Aye. You can polish that up. Uh, so we haven't got soul food this evening uh, because uh, we've got our carol service next Sunday evening. So uh, sorry if you were looking forward to it this evening, but we just have to wait one more week for a really special occasion. But if uh, what you've heard this morning has really spoken to you, please do come for prayer. There'll be prayer available at the front left. If you are waiting on God to move uh, and you need further hope to keep waiting well, just come and ask somebody to pray with you or for whatever it, whatever it might be, do come forward and be prayed for. But let us join together in our, our closing uh, prayer. Father God, as you lead us out onto our front lines, help us to love you each other and our communities to release the gifts you've given us and to invite others to meet with Jesus. Amen. 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 Great to see you this morning. Do remember uh, to sign up or take a flyer for the bereavement journey. And also, uh, Vicky will be just outside room one with all the Christmas cards that we need to get out. Do come and see her. Uh, grab a pack. Uh, and let's make sure that our community knows what we're doing this Christmas. Bless you all. <laughs>